Hey folks, the Field and Garden Podcast is honored to be partnering with the Growing for Market magazine. They have been publishing practical ideas and information for direct market flower and vegetable growers for over 31 years. All the articles are written by farmers who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. The magazine is still on the same mission as when the Flower Farmer book author Lynn Bozinski founded this magazine back in 1992 to connect growers with the best ideas from other growers. There is dedicated flower content in every magazine. A decade's worth of back issues and over 1,600 archived articles from writers like Aaron Benzenkang, Gretel Adams, Pamela and Frank Arnowski, and Jonathan and Megan Leese, all available on the website. With 10 new issues every year available on paper, digital, or both, you're guaranteed to find something to fine tune your farm and growing for market. So if you do farmer's markets, CSA, farm stands, pick your own florist sales, or wholesaling, whether you're a commercial grower or you just want to grow like one, subscribe to Growing for Market for the nitty gritty details of growing, marketing, and the business of local farming. And I have a special offer for you. Use the coupon code WORKSHOP to get 25% off any subscription to the original Farmer to Farmer magazine at growingformarket.com. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend and host, Lisa Mason Ziegler. Thanks so much for dropping in. And I don't know about you, but here in southeastern Virginia at the end of November, we just had our first hard frost, and that pushes us into a whole new season of different type of chores and duties. And I thought, what a great time to talk about caring for cool flowers, actually the way that I care for cool flowers. And so that's what today's episode is full of. But before we jump in, I have one question for you guys. So did you break the Dave Dowling golden rule and actually eat turkey at Thanksgiving before you ordered your Lysianthus plugs. <laughs> so friends, that is kind of Dave's rule of, of his kind of flag is that you should not have your Thanksgiving dinner until you have ordered your Lysianthus plugs. And that is because Lysianthus takes a super long lead time, 12 to 16 weeks, um, which is why most of us actually order plugs instead of starting from seed now. It's just, a, you know, the plug growers are much better and equipped to do that than we are. So if you haven't already ordered your plugs for Lysianthus that is planted in very early spring, because, you know, Lysianthus is a cool flower. So that is your reminder for that. And I have another public service announcement, and it's from the wife of the plumber. I don't, you may or may not know that my husband, Stevie, um, is a plumber. They own a family plumbing business and have since 1969. And I feel like I get so many gifts from him in knowledge um, about dealing with water and um, all of those bits and pieces here on my farm. And something that I think most people don't realize, as I didn't, is that, you know, those reels that we push around our farm, um, the hose reels that are, have wheels so you can move it, um, that reel is very susceptible to freezing because there's water in the actual reel and in those fittings. So you definitely need to be bring. it may already be too late for some people, um, you actually, we push our reel and hose inside the farm building to keep it from going below freezing. Um, I have ruined more reels through the years, um, and Steve now adds that to his list of reminders for me when he is typically um, draining our wells for the winter, 
as we just did yesterday, which is what reminded me to share this with you guys. Um, he said, and go get your reel and push it in the building. So that's just your public service announcement um, from the plumber's wife, who happens to be the flower farmer. All right, friends, um, you know that this podcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where you'll find all the things that I mentioned, the resources, the tool seeds, supplies, the online courses are all over there, as well as, friends, we have a sister podcast now, Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane, and Lane is our seed manager at the Gardener's Workshop, who also is an avid gardener, a seed starter, and she's also an engineer, y'all, so she brings a whole nother depth of information to you, um, and I'm learning, listening to her. So things that I we've just never gone deep dives on. So I invite you to check out Seed Talk. You'll find it on wherever you listen to podcasts to give a listen and to follow and to give a review if you're actually enjoying it. So we love bringing you guys more resources and appreciate when you let us know um, that you're uh, that they're helpful to you, right? All right, friends, so let's jump into some cool flower caring steps, the way that I kind of do it here on the farm. Um, and first, so Cool Flowers is um, the name of my book that is about cool season hardy annuals. And I feel like the concept is still so foreign to so many people, and that's all rooted in y'all. Because when people hear the word annual, they immediately think of the most common, well-known group of annuals, and that is warm season. You know, when somebody says, I'm planting annuals, everybody automatically thinks of those that get planted once it's warm outside and you're heading into your long warm season, summer-like behavior for the weather patterns. And when I say cool season hardy annuals, or I say, are you fall planting hardy annuals? People are like, what? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? So I feel like the concept is, I mean, we have reached like a BB in the Astrodome <laughs> to the number of people that actually know about this concept. So I feel like I need to just open this with saying there are more than one type of annual. There's warm season tender annuals, which are those plants like zinnias and sunflowers and basil and tomatoes and um, those things that we start and plant at the beginning and during the warm season, that those plants thrive in warm to hot conditions. Well, there's a whole nother group that fell off of our radar decades ago as um, the gardening shifted in the world, which we're not going to go into all of that business, right? We don't have time. Um, but cool season hardy annuals, because of their awkward, different planting time, the garden centers and nurseries just kind of let them fall by the wayside. And it was because they didn't, they weren't being sold during those high demand seasons. And so they just went away. And friends, our grandmothers practiced this for decades, long ago. I did not make this up. But we are talking about cool flowers are the flowers that are known as cool season hardy annuals that don't just survive cool to cold weather. They thrive in it when you follow a few ground rules, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. So um, I do want to say you can learn a lot more about this over at the Gardener's Workshop. If you go to our resources and go to the blog, in the blog, there's actually a cool flower category, and the biggest post in there is the Cool Season Flower Chronicles, and that is actually a five-video series um, all about my most frequently asked questions about this group, but we have piggybacked on that post 
all of the other resources. There are webinars, there's planting guides, there's so much information you can request there. So find all of that there at thegardenersworkshop.com under the Field and Garden um, blog and podcast. So I know that, so if you are one of those people that aren't really familiar with it, um, you need to get the book, get all the resources that go along with it, and dive in because it includes some of the most beloved spring and blooming flowers like Bells of Ireland and Sweet Peas. And yes, even those of us in the South can grow those. Friends, it's all about the timing. It's when we can all plant them, but we perhaps all plant them at different timing depending on where we live. So that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about after you have figured that out, and you are, in fact, fall planting some stuff and maybe even some very early spring planting. These are the steps that I follow to care for those transplants and direct seeded stuff. Sorry, y'all, you know, I'm sipping coffee. It's a Saturday morning. So I want to first just give you a little punch list of what I find to be the most common causes of the loss of cool flowers. Um, it's not always what people think. Um, people oftentimes don't have all the facts and then, you know, loss happens. I just lost something two days ago. I'm always experimenting. So loss is a good thing. It's part of your learning, right? So the common causes that I find people lose cool flowers over. Number one, growing those cool season hardy annuals and fall planting them when they are not winter hardy in your winter hardiness zone. I'll say that again. Fall planting those cool flowers that are not winter hardy in your zone. So an example of when they are hardy, let's just say I'm in zone seven and I want to plant snapdragons. I would go look snapdragons up either in the cool flower book or on the Gardener's Workshop store product page for Snapdragons, because right there it tells you what zones they're hardy to, and see, oh, Snapdragons are hardy, and that means they survive winter in my winter hardiness zone. I should fall plant them to reap all the benefits of more established, taller stems, more abundance, and they're more disease and pest resistant. So that's the number one reason. People just think, oh, I'm, I want to fall plant X, Y, Z without even thinking, well, is it hardy in my zone? That is such a common cause of death. And then people think it doesn't work. <laughs> it does work when you follow the concept rules, right? Then the second most common thing that we struggle with here is cool season hardy annuals are are very susceptible to wet feet, meaning poor drainage. Because during fall and winter and early spring, um, because there's no heat outside, right? The ground doesn't dry out as quickly. So what, um, poor drainage is really revealed during that time. So you need to always focus on planting your cool flowers in the best drainage you've got. And what I'm always doing is trying to build those beds. So we oftentimes, um, we plant cool flowers in no-till areas and we are just constantly putting more compost and mulch on top of those beds in an effort to increase drainage, right? Um, so the pathways are um, not are permanent and the beds are just getting taller and taller. And that just really helps every single year. And then the third most common is that people plant late, whether it be in very early spring or in fall. So let's talk about fall first. If you're planting really late, then you're not allowing your plantings to get established before they faced winter conditions. Now, you can push the envelope on transplants if you give them a little bit of extra TLC, meaning hoops and row cover, to help them become more established. But if you're going to expect plants to be planted this week 
and then to face super cold, deep winter conditions next week, it's not going to happen. That's like leaving a tray of transplants sitting out on your carport. They have no root foundation, right? And when you plant late with no additional support, you're going to lose them. So those are the three most common reasons that I find that we lose transplants and that I hear from people that not transplants, cool flowers. That's any of them, right? So those are three areas you need to pay special attention to. So here is my list of my cool flower care steps, I guess you would say. So first off, out of the gate is I try really hard to plant my direct seeded crops on time for the very reason I just kind of mentioned to you, right? So that is six to eight. So fall planting of direct seeded crops, the optimal time is six to eight weeks before your first expected frost. That allows those seeds enough time to wake up, sprout, and grow into a little transplant before winter conditions come, right? And then my um, next step for those guys, as I've already done a couple of times this year, is to run your garden or razor hoe through those direct seeded beds every 10 to 14 days. It totally depends on what your conditions are like. I mean, if you're continuing to have warm weather longer than you expect, the, the winter cool season hardy annual weeds are growing just as well as your trans, your direct sowed flowers, right? If you don't have our garden, we call it a garden hoe, it's a trapezoid hoe, and the razor hoe, totally depend on those two stand-up hoes in this time of the year to make my spring a breeze by what I've done this fall. And that means running my garden hoe um, through the beds every 10 to 14 days before we go into deep winter. And there are videos attached to the product page over at thegardenersworkshop.com so you can see how that actually works. And friends, if you're going to be doing any direct seeding, you got to have a hoe and actually no-till. So I've mentioned that I, number one, try to direct seed on time. Um, and that is really my whole focus the end of summer. You know, I'm thinking, all right, I got to get those beds made so we can direct seed at the proper time. I will admit that I push the transplants to the back seat because I, ha I feel like I have more wiggle room. The big pressure is getting the beds prepared on time because this is what happens, friends. As we start heading into fall, cooler temperatures, shorter days, more rain maybe, the soil will never dry out. So you have got to get those beds for all of your fall planting of transplants and direct seeding, as well as your very early spring planted beds have got to be made at the end of summer before you run into wet soil because it'll never dry out like right now. Our soil, unless you've got no-till beds, um, you are not going to be preparing beds, um, making beds once the soil gets wet because that destroys soil structure, which you will never, ever regain it. Um, all right, so the other thing I get, this is a really common question about how do we water in the fall and then what do we do to winterize our irrigation? So it's kind of like this. We hand water all fall planted plantings. They're never irrigated in the fall and during winter. That prevents us, see the beds aren't even hooked up until very early spring when we need them. Um, because we don't want to put water in those main lines you know, we take our filters off of our hose bibs. There's no water in the system anywhere. So we, when we make cool flower beds and we lay irrigation, the tea tape is in the bed, but we're not using that tea tape because that puts water in all of your irrigation tapes and header pipes. 
that then have to be blown out or once you get into freezing, you're going to have cracking fittings. Um, so the way that we just avoid all of that work is we hand water because part of the joy of the cool season hardy annuals that you're planting um, that are winter hardy in your zone and your fall planting um, is that first off, the soil doesn't dry out as much that the, the problem of wet soil and not being able to make beds later is a gift to all your plantings because you don't have to water as often. So it's not like during the summer where you're out there having to water all the time. If you do a deep hand watering, I use a, we use a hose with a wand with a super soaker, fine, you know, um, water pour on it. Oftentimes we water at the time of planting or direct seeding. Um, and then our transplants sometimes aren't even watered again. It totally depends on your rainfall. Um, but if we're getting frequent rain and the soil is staying fairly moist, we don't even have to water. We do water our direct seeded stuff by hand. And if you follow my instructions for direct seeding, it is a quick, I mean, it takes five minutes to run over a hundred foot bed to water it every single day until they're really up and growing. Um, so we do not irrigate in the fall and during winter. We hand water when it's needed, but it's not needed nearly as often as people tend to think. So then the next question and step is the row covers. So we tend to try to put down all of our hoops and weight bags and lay row covers in the garden to be on standby when we need them. And when we, I put up the row covers, first off, you need to know that I typically only grow what's winter, I only fall plant what's winter hardy in my garden um, because I, I'm not trying to push the envelope. Now, I'm almost always got one bed that's full of experimental cool flowers, which I just killed one of those two nights ago. Um, I didn't realize it was going, I didn't realize our hard frost was coming. I don't think anybody really did. And the bed wasn't covered and it whacked a plant that had been suggested to me is a cool season hardy annual and it still may be, but it's obviously not winter hardy in my zone. It may be like straw flowers that I plant in very early spring anyway, because the covers weren't up. So we equip our garden with hoops, weight bags, and row covers on all the cool flowers to be on standby. And then I only put the covers up on those crops that I feel like are susceptible or need added protection. Um, so when I actually, um, put, we only put cool, the, the row covers up on cool flowers for those that are winter hardy when the temperatures are starting to dip below 25 at night and stay in there. You know, it's like, this is a great example. It's going to be cold tonight in, you know, like 28 or 29, but we're going back up to 60. So unless it's a susceptible test product, test plant, I'm not even going to cover them because they really aren't going to sustain any damage because, again, I'm only growing what's winter hardy for me, and that's a normal temperature, right? So my basic practice is to have them in the garden, and then when it goes down below 25 degrees and it looks like it's going to hang out there, I put them up. And then when would I take them back down is if the days start creeping up above 50 or 55 degrees. I mean, that may mean that we're going up and down a lot. This did not used to happen, y'all. When I first started growing cool flowers 25 years ago, it got cold at Thanksgiving and stayed cold. We put them up and pretty much ignored them. Um, so that's kind of my method but again, I'm only growing those things, talking about growing those things that are winter hardy in your actual um, winter hardiness zone. So the other thing is to not torment yourself. Um, the biggest, hardest thing that farmers can do um, with cool flowers is to helicopter, be a helicopter parent. Um, and be peeking under the row cover all winter. I'm going to tell you, they're going to look like frozen little popsicles. And that's the way they should look. 
that little stem that you're looking at is just the anchor to the root system that is established underground. So kind of resist peeking under the covers. And if you do peek, know that they're going to look like little frozen popsicles. So uh, another common question I get is, what do, what do I do about fertilizing um, cool flowers that are fall planted? Um, so all of our beds, when we prepare them, are prepared with the same, um, with the dry organic chicken litter based fertilizer. You can find it on our website to read more about it. Um, and it's in our store. And all of our beds are prepared with that. So they're already, that's sitting in the bed waiting for them. I would not do any additional fertilization until very early spring when you actually see growth starting to happen. You know, when you're starting to uncover beds and it's starting to warm up during the days. Um, and then we would use liquid seaweed fish, the Neptune's Harvest, that you can also find on our website. You can do a soil drench, which means just pouring it on the soil. You can foliar feed, which means sprinkling it or spraying it on the foliage. Um, or you can run it through the irrigation, but we would not do any of that until you see little spray starting to grow again um, in very early spring. And then the other thing we do in very early spring is we may pull the covers down and hand weed a bed that's been gone through winter and they are um, starting to show growth and then your little chickweeds and the hen bits also take off. Those are the common winter weeds that we get here. Um, about that same time is when you're doing your very early spring planting. Um, and so all of those cool season hardy annuals that we may be planting again, that we planted in fall, but we're planting them again for a season extension. But for those that don't go through winter for us, stuff like stock, um, and straw flowers um, are some of those that just we don't plant in the fall. We'd be planting those, and during that time is when we start kind of shoring up our fall planted stuff with a little bit of hand weeding, maybe a little bit of that fertilization, um, touching up the mulch. Um, if we're using mulch, um, I'll just pause for a minute now and say that this year, the lion's share of our fall planted beds were planted back into our no-till area, which means they have organic type mulch on them, you know, shredded bark or that type of stuff in place of the Bio 360. And I will tell you that we are still having to do 10 times the amount of hand weeding that we do when we have to use Bio 360. Um, I feel like the fall planted stuff benefits the most from Bio360, which is, if you're not familiar, that is the biodegradable film that looks like plastic, but it's made from a corn byproduct. You can learn more about it on our website. We sell it in individual pieces or six packs. Because when you fall plant, the vegetation part of the plant is not really growing like a warm. When you plant zinnias and those types of plants in summer, they quickly grow a canopy of vegetation on the top that immediately starts to sh um, shade and squeeze out any weed pressure growing. That is not the case for cool season hardy annuals. They sit there all winter with just a little stem and the cool season weeds really have the advantage. And so what I'm learning is there is great advantage to using the Bio360 um, covered beds to plant our transplants in. You can't do it with direct seeding, or at least we don't. Um, and so there is a great advantage to covering your beds with Bio360. And if you put the black side up, which is what we recommend when you fall plant, you also get a little additional heat of your soil um, because the black side is up. So that is just my observation from these last three years of experimenting with no-till beds. Um, the weed pressure, the weed seed sprouting pressure is pretty intense, but we don't find that to be the case with warm season stuff. Um, 
and the other so that you know you've gone through all this early very early spring planting and touching up and all those things and then you need to immediately address netting um, I always have some beds that get away from us because I just underestimate how quick the beds are going to start shooting up stem length um, flower support netting is essential for us. We get torrential rain here. It only takes a five minute downpour to flatten a crop. Um, so you need to get your netting on as soon as you get those row covers off and you've done your touch up. The next step is immediately to net. And then the other, the, the wrap up tip that I have is what you're going to learn and you should be notating on your planting calendar is when certain crops start to bloom for you in your with your care your your um your your conditions and sometimes there's some crops that really start earlier than you have a market for you know if like for us I'm thinking about um Iceland poppies and bachelor buttons and calendula are the first bloomers for us. And if I'm selling at farmer's markets, but it doesn't start until the 1st of May, they would have already come and gone, almost. The tail end of them would still be going. But make notes on your calendar of those crops that maybe you shouldn't even grow because guess what? You don't have anywhere to sell them yet. You don't really want to get started. Because friends, I'll tell you this, Having one or two or three crops starting super early is not really very useful to your business most often. Um, that means you have to drag out all of the next step of your season. How I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast that we've had our first hard frost, well, that brings on a whole new level of chores. Well, it's the same thing when the harvest season comes. Do you really, is it really profitable for you to start your season earlier, you have to have a lot of stuff, a lot of flowers to do that. And so make those notations also on your calendar because you'll you be it's surprising how much you forget. Um, so those are kind of my go through winter cool flower tips. And I mean, basically, I don't want to do anything to cool flowers through the winter. If I have followed the cool flower concept and planted on time, planted those things that are winter hardy in my zone, it is the easiest crops of the year. And they bloom in the highest demand where you can get top dollar for them. Um, but you just have to wrap your head around the entire concept not just rush in and start fall planting stuff because you think that's going to be the best for you. You have to have some facts, friends. Folks, if you're enjoying my podcast, I appreciate so much if you drop a review, tell your friends, share it with your friends, um, as well as it being on our podcast, on podcast apps everywhere. You can find it on our website, um, if you're not a podcast app listener, you can share it with your friends that way. And you can also go over there and actually search, use keywords to search our resource of all of our blogs and podcasts. So folks, don't forget you can sign up for our farm news over at thegardenersworkshop.com. It's a weekly newsletter of everything from the podcast to the a blog post. It's just a real roundup of all the resources that we're offering you. And I invite you to subscribe. All right, friends, until we meet again. Ciao.